A young, loyal, hardworking husband and father goes missing while duck hunting on Lake Seminole. A search is launched, but he's nowhere to be found. Given the hazardous stumps lying just beneath the lake's surface, it is soon assumed that he has fallen overboard, drowned, and that alligators have fully consumed his body. But experts and authorities are skeptical. They suspect foul play, and their suspicions are correct. What ultimately comes to light is a scenario that no one saw coming. Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginning until well after other reporting ends. Where do we even begin with this case? We genuinely don't even know how to describe how this case will trigger every extreme emotion. You will be angry, and you will very likely cry. Like us, you won't have a choice. You'll see. And before we get started, if you like how we present this case, please help us out by hitting like and subscribe. Let's go. Jerry Michael Williams, who went by Michael or Mike, was born in Bradfordville, Florida, to parents Jerry and Cheryl Williams. The couple also had another son, Mike's older brother, Nick. But Jerry working as a Greyhound bus driver and Cheryl running a home daycare so that she could be at home with her children, the family was comfortable but frugal. They opted to live in a trailer instead of buying a traditional home, preferring to save the money so they could later spend it on their children's education. And that, they did. They saved up and sent the boys to a private high school. By everyone's account, Mike was as kind of a person as they come. Always stepping in to offer help. Always responsible, always there whenever you need him. His mother noted how he never walked anywhere. He always ran. He was always eager to get things done and to help people. And so, it was no surprise that Mike was a stellar student, excelling academically and athletically. He was the captain of the football team as well as class president. It was during high school that he met fellow student Denise Merrill. Denise was a cheerleader and also worked with Mike on student council. The two quickly fell for each other and began dating. The couple would become very close with another couple, Mike's best friend since ninth grade, Brian Winchester, and his girlfriend, Kathy. They would double date regularly and were generally inseparable. Having hunted with his dad since he was six years old, Mike took up duck hunting during his high school years. A passion both he and Brian shared. It became Mike's favorite hobby. In 1988, Mike, Denise, Brian, and Kathy all graduated high school. The couples remained close after graduating. And in 1994, both couples got married. Mike had begun working in the real estate industry and Brian as an agent selling insurance. Mike's work ethic and kind and humble character continued on during his employment. The owner of the company where he worked remarked at how he was the hardest working man he'd ever known, how he never took days off, and would work such long hours that he'd have to take the building keys away from him to prevent him from coming to work over the weekend. After five years of marriage, Mike and Denise welcomed a daughter in 1999, who they named Ansley. We're just totally overwhelmed. She was due Tuesday, and she would have made me wait a whole nother year for Mother's Day, so she came yesterday so I could enjoy this day today with her. It was unbelievable. I have a whole new respect for my wife and women in general and what they go through to bring a, a new child, new life into the world. And just prior to Ansley being born, Brian and Kathy also welcomed a child, a son. Around the time of Ansley's birth, Mike's dad passed away. It was hard on Mike, but it made him cherish his family that much more. As a result, Mike began having conversations with his insurance agent slash best friend, Brian, about making sure his family was taken care of should anything happen to him. So Brian wrote up a $1 million life insurance policy on Mike to go along with two other policies he'd arranged for him in the past, one for half a million and one for a quarter million, bringing his total coverage to $1.75 million. The Williams family seemed happy and content with a nice home and a loving family. It was midwinter 2000 and Mike decided to unwind from the week's work by going duck hunting. He left before the sun rose and set out for Lake Seminole, one of his favorite duck hunting destinations. The lake was about an hour away, so when Mike had not returned by noon, Denise called her father. She told him that Mike had not come home yet and that she was worried 
because he knew they were supposed to celebrate their sixth wedding anniversary that day. She also notified their best friend Brian, and Brian and her father drove out to the lake to find Mike. They were joined by Florida Fish and Wildlife to search for the missing hunter. After hours of searching, they finally found Mike's Ford Bronco, near an isolated boat dock. A helicopter was called in to help with the search, particularly given that Lake Seminole covered 30,000 acres. Then, finally, after nine hours of searching, Mike's boat was located. Inside, authorities found a shotgun, still in its case, decoys, life jackets, and more. This indicated that Mike was not actively involved in hunting when he disappeared since his shotgun was still in its case. Also, the inside of the boat was relatively clean. It didn't contain any of the mud, water, or other mess typically found during the process of hunting. Authorities were baffled. The cove where Mike's boat was found is believed to have been an orchard at one point back before the adjacent rivers were dammed to create the lake. They actually called the cove Stump Field due to the many remaining stumps that peaked above and below the water level, which forced any powerboats in the area to exercise extreme caution. So it seemed reasonable to investigators to theorize that Mike had hit a stump with his boat, fallen out, sunk into the 8 to 12 foot water, and then drowned, unable to save himself once his waders filled with water and pulled him down. Once daylight arrived, the puzzled investigators began taking a closer look at Mike's boat. They quickly determined that his gas tank was almost completely full, indicating that the engine had hardly run at all. They also inspected the boat's propeller. If the boat had hit a stump, there should be wood residue on the propeller blades. But there was not any residue. Given in those findings, they determined that Mike must certainly be nearby. So they deploy 15 boats along with a helicopter, but they still don't find any trace of Mike. Then, on the 10th day, in an area they'd searched numerous times, searchers found a camouflage pattern hat which Brian confirms belonged to Mike. Authorities continue searching for days, then weeks, then months, but with little optimism of finding Mike alive. By February of 2001, the search is called off. A private search team that was helping officials with the search theorized that Mike was likely eaten by the alligators that infested those waters. But that theory didn't ring true to many people, including Mike's mother, Cheryl Williams, who used to worry about the alligators whenever her son went hunting. She would later recall, I was always afraid that an alligator would get him. And he would tell me, alligators sleep when the water's cold. And we only hunt ducks when the weather is cold. Wildlife authorities and experts also did not agree with the alligator theory, knowing that alligators don't feed during the cold temperatures. They stated, all they are doing is maintaining their body temperature, and that it was too cold for an alligator to be interested in food at all. They noted that even if an alligator had defied all known gator behavior and eaten Mike, they would have most certainly left something behind. They called the theory a stretch, noting that of the 80 known deaths on the lake by that time, every single one had been found. They said it would be very, very unusual to have the complete disappearance of a full-grown man. Almost six months after Mike went missing, a pair of waders were found floating in Lake Seminole. Then, two days later, a jacket was found. Inside its pocket was Mike's hunting license. Despite the new findings not even remotely proving Mike's fate, Denise petitions a judge to declare Mike legally dead. Based on the new discoveries, a judge agrees and grants Denise a death certificate. That decision allowed Denise to immediately file claims against her husband's life insurance policies, which she promptly did. Mike's death was officially ruled as accidental drowning, and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or FDLE, closed the case. A short while after that, Mike's mother, Cheryl Williams, encountered Brian, who shared the news about the death certificate with her. She recalled their conversation, stating, I learned about the death certificate from Brian Winchester. Brian stopped me in his truck, and he said, Well, I guess you're surprised that they declared Michael dead so quickly. And I looked at him, and I said, Well, no, Brian. Not with the way that evidence just popped up out of the clear blue. And he said, What do you mean, Miss Williams? That was a gift from God. I said, Brian, I've had gifts from God. That was not. 
those waiters were planted. And many others agreed. Fish and wildlife, who had instantly rejected the alligator theory, were highly skeptical about this mysteriously appearing evidence. But tasked with analyzing the clothing, they scrutinized the suspicious waiters, looking for any signs of deteriorated human remains, trauma, or alligator teeth marks. They didn't find any. Additionally, any waiters that would have been in the water for six months would have accumulated a thick layer of slime, making them nearly impossible to pick up. But those waiters looked practically new and didn't have any slime on them. Likewise, Mike's hunting license, also supposedly in the water for nearly six months, was nearly pristine. A license in the water for that long should have deteriorated and been completely illegible. Authorities felt this newly found evidence that had somehow been overlooked during the exhaustive, months-long searches had been staged. But without any direct evidence of foul play, the case went cold. But not for Cheryl Williams. She did not buy the flawed theories. She knew her son did not drown in the lake, and he was not eaten by alligators. And she would not rest until she brought her son home. She had friends make cards to hand out with his picture on it. She bought billboards, tacked posters anywhere she could, and she marched. She took her homemade picket sign to churches, to the police, and to whoever she thought could help her, trying desperately to get authorities to reopen her son's case. Police told her that her son was eaten by alligators, and that that was not criminal. But still, she marched, in her one-woman picket line, fighting for her son. Until February 2004. Police finally concede to the persistent mother and reopen the case. Since the case had been cold for several years, investigators were essentially looking for anything they'd missed previously. And the fresh insight paid off. They started noticing one name that continued to surface that didn't stand out to them at the time. Brian Winchester. He was the one who found Mike's boat in the dark, in the middle of the night, when the multitude of other searchers could not. He was the one who identified the hat found on the lake as Mike's. And to their surprise, he was the one who wrote up the most recent $1 million life insurance policy on Mike. Brian and his wife Kathy had since separated in 2001 and divorced in 2003. Investigators began re-piecing together what they had. While a lot of evidence was either lost or not captured due to the initial assumption that there was no foul play, they still had some clues, including when the boat was found, its engine was off and it had a full tank of gas. If Mike had fallen off of the boat, it would have been because he hit a stump while the engine was running. And if that were the case, the engine would have stayed on and the boat would have run in circles until it ran out of fuel. There was a storm that should have carried the boat in the opposite direction from where it was found. And Mike didn't usually hunt alone. So by this point, all the investigators involved were confident that this was a suspicious missing person case. And given Brian's connection at every point, they were beginning to be convinced of his involvement in Mike's disappearance. Then in 2005, just as the investigation was heating up, Brian and Denise got married. While some were shocked, many others were keenly aware that the pair had been having an affair for years, even before Mike's disappearance. With suspicions having arisen about Brian, and with him suddenly married to the beneficiary of the life insurance policy that helped draw suspicion to him in the first place, police had their eye on the couple. But without any forensic evidence from the scene near the time of the disappearance, or Mike's body, or enough evidence for a search warrant or arrest, it was impossible for police to make a case. So, even though they felt strongly that the newly married Winchesters were involved, the FDLE closed its case in 2006 and stopped returning Cheryl Williams' phone calls. But investigators never lost sight of the case. They were patient. They knew that someday something would happen, someone would crack and reveal the truth. And they were right. By 2011, with the case still cold, Cheryl Williams had not given up. Starting New Year's Day 2012, she began writing one letter each day to Governor Rick Scott, requesting either a special prosecutor or someone other than the FDLE investigate her son's death. After not receiving so much as a single acknowledgement that her letters were even being received, she dug deep to find out why. She found that the governor's office had forwarded each and every one of her letters, unopened, to the FDLE, where they were being placed in a case file. 
Cheryl was livid, but she would not have to fight too much longer. At the end of 2012, Denise and Brian Winchester became separated. Then, a few years later in 2015, Denise filed for divorce. Brian fought the divorce as long as he could, but ultimately had to concede. And as they were in the final stretch of the divorce, on the evening of August 5, 2016, Denise was in her car talking with her sister when she noticed someone emerge from the back seat. It was Brian. He was distraught over the divorce and because she had not returned his calls or text. His mother had also just been diagnosed with terminal cancer and his teenage son he had with Kathy decided to move in with her instead of him. He held Denise at gunpoint and ordered her to drive. Instead of going where he told her to go, she pulled into a CVS parking lot. She was able to talk to him and calm him down. She then drove him back to his truck. When he got out of the car, he grabbed several things from her back seat that he brought with him, including a couple of sheets, bleach, and tools. He clearly had plans. He apologized to her and made her promise not to report their little encounter to the police. Which she promptly did the moment he left. At the Leon County Sheriff's Office, Denise reports that her estranged husband just kidnapped her at gunpoint. He, you know, was up and grabbing me and um, he pulled my face pretty hard. And he goes, you know, he's cussing, you know, you, you will turn here, you will turn here, blah, blah, blah. And I kept going straight. And I'm like, second, I didn't do what he told me to do. So then he goes, I'm going to effing hurt you if you don't, you turn here. And I kept going straight again. And then, and I turned around and I go, what do you mean hurt me? And he pulled out a gun, like, a gun, not a hunting gun, but like a gun that he would kill someone with. And he put it right here in my ribs. He put it right here and he goes with this and he pressed it in there. And so I just kept saying, you, you've got to stop living that way. You've got, you know, you could get us all back if you'll just turn your life around because he was a Christian at one point. And I was like, if you'll just turn back to the Lord, so the whole time I'm turning this way, I'm buckled in, but he's he's calm, he's calming down. And so but the gun's still right there. And I'm just like, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And he's like, what am I doing? I could tell he was, you know, and I was like, I don't know. I know you want to talk to me. And, and I'm, this is not the way to do it. I know, what have I done? And it's like he kind of woke God, like, what have I done? What have I done? It's the break they've been waiting years for. The FDLE are immediately called in, and everyone involved is fully aware of the background, the scenario, and the stakes. During her three hour talk with police, they go for information about Mike's disappearance. Where do you think Mike's buried at? Oh, I, I have no idea. Any speculation on that? On where he's buried? Buried. I mean, I believe. You don't really believe he, he died at on the lake. I do. Why? I just, I just always have. That's what I believe. And I have, from when he was saying roundabout, I have, I don't know, I talked with the last two people and I can't remember if he wanted me to turn left or right. I no, 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 you, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, Why do you think Mike perished in the lake? I just, because he didn't, he didn't die in Lake Seminole, okay? I don't, that's what I've always believed, that's what I believe. And why? I've never been proven anything different. I don't... Well, is there any proof he died? If he would have perished in that lake, he would have been found, okay? There's never been a person that has fallen over or whatever that they've never found except for Mike. I mean, that's literally, it's, it's, it's a possibility. That he died in that lake. I guess to that, that's just what I believe. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, you you knew all the information about you know what was recovered out there and all that, right? My dad would keep me updated. Yeah. yeah. And then investigators start revealing information that they had been keeping under wraps. Information that exposed far more of a relationship than any of the suspects had divulged. I guess you, Mike, Kathy, and Brian, y'all are pretty close before Mike disappeared, right? Yeah. yeah. How close were y'all? I mean, I would say we talk pretty much every day. We were very close. Yeah. I'm still very close with Kathy. Yeah, I know that. I mean, again, we researched, you know, trips y'all used to make to Orlando and some other stuff. Apparently, you were really close, okay? Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't... We, yeah, me and Kathy still, she's texting me right now, so we're still very close. Okay. 
If I say we're totally aware of all the, vi the videos, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you say what? The videos. I would have to see them. Oh, no, that's not going to happen. But you, okay. you're clueless when I say videos. I don't, yeah. You, you, Kathy and Brian? I would have to see them. Yeah. You're, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't say you've got to see it. No, I'm just, I'm just starting to feel very uncomfortable. Okay. But well, I'm, I'm, I've been uncomfortable for a long time because we needed some things on this case. More about the relationship he was referring to in a moment. The interview continues and Denise deflects their attempts to get information about Mike's disappearance at every turn. They inform her that they will be arresting Brian and that he may be more willing to talk about the disappearance. She doesn't waver, but they are not worried. Because with the kidnapping claim, they can now arrest Brian. And that will turn out to be the real break they need in the case. Brian is arrested and charged with kidnapping, domestic assault, and armed burglary. Two of which are felonies. Investigators accurately share with Brian that he's facing up to 30 years in prison for the kidnapping. And they offer him a plea deal. Share what he knows about Mike Williams' disappearance and they won't pursue any charges against him for that case. He takes them up on their offer. He shares everything he knows. And it's a lot. He starts with the fact that he and Denise had been having an affair long before Mike's disappearance. So I've known Denise my whole life, basically since preschool. We started having an affair October 13th, 1997. Basically, Denise made it clear she would never get divorced, primarily because of appearances. She is ultra concerned about the way that she appears to the world. Mike knew something was up, but he didn't know what was up. I know Denise told me that he went to Denise's mom, Johnny Merrill, and was asking her or concerned about money, cash that was disappearing from their accounts. And he didn't know if she was having an affair. So Denise was getting worried that things were going to blow up. And she was concerned about getting, not getting divorced because of the appearances of it, but also because she was scared to lose her daughter. She didn't want to lose any time with her daughter. There was also that $500,000 policy. I believe it was paid semi-annually or quarterly. Denise paid the bills. The plan with, with Mike, when I sold him the million dollar policy, was that he was going to drop the $500,000. He wasn't going to keep that. Denise knew the timing on the $500,000 policy and when it was supposed to be lapsing. And I can't tell you what that date was, but it, it was going to be soon after December of 2000. Their anniversary was also coming up. I think there was pressure from Mike on her. They needed to have another baby or something like that. There was just a lot of pressure. It was the best way I can describe it. So sometime in 2000, the subject of Mike or Kathy's deaths started coming up in conversations. There was no point in talking about anything happening with Kathy. That was not going to happen. I was not going to do anything like that to my son. Brian then outlined several scenarios that he and Denise considered to murder Mike. They settled on a date, changed the date, and when the final date arrived, Brian met Mike under the guise of duck hunting and proceeded as planned. We went to the landing where his truck was found. We launched the boat. It was just like a hunting trip was supposed to be. The plan that was discussed and come up with was that he was going to be wearing waders. The belief was somebody falls in the water with waders, you're going down. We went out like we were going hunting. We got to the area where his waders and jacket were found. I got him to stand up and I pushed him into the water. He got his jacket off and his waders off. I was driving the boat. I didn't know what to do. 
and I ended up shooting him. <laughs> Brian then got Mike's body into his car, pushed the boat back out, then went to rendezvous with his father-in-law who he had also planned to go hunting with that morning to establish his alibi. But realizing he wouldn't make it to meet his father-in-law on time, he went home where Kathy was still sleeping, and got into bed with her, establishing his new alibi. Then he pretended to just wake up, called his father-in-law to say he'd overslept and wouldn't make it, then went off to bury Mike's body in a remote location. He tells police where they can find the body, which turns out to be just five miles from his mother's home. They retrieve Mike's body wrapped in a tarp, and still wearing his wedding band. In December of 2017, Brian is tried and convicted of the aggravated kidnapping charge. At his sentencing hearing, Denise reads a statement with her recommendation for his sentence. Your Honor, I'm here today to ask you to sentence Brian Winchester to the maximum penalty under the law for the crimes that he committed against me on August the 5th, 2016. It's been 16 months since he broke into my car, hid in the back waiting on me, scared the life out of me, jump, jumping up while I was driving, shoved a gun in my ribs, and kidnapped me. I have relived it every single day, and it is always with me. He made the choice to plan and act out the crimes of August the 5th. He is the reason he has been sitting in jail the past 16 months. He's the reason that he lost me and his children. Since August the 5th, 2016, I have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and with extreme anxiety. I start each day with the memory of him jumping out of the back and I end each day feeling the gun shoved in my ribs when it turned on my right side trying to sleep. Each day when I get in my car to go to work, I look back to check the back seats. This is my life now. We all have the right to feel secure and safe. And he took my sense of security and safety from me. He stole it from me. And I will never be what? He stole it from me and I will never be the same. I live each day with the fear of his retaliation for my decision to tell. He will finish what he has started, no matter what age he is when he's released. For all of these reasons, I'm asking you to sentence him to life in prison for the crimes he has committed. It comes down to my life or his, and I'm asking you please to choose life. Thank you. Brian is sentenced to 20 years in prison, and as agreed upon, he will not face trial for Mike's murder. Based on the information Brian has shared and from the investigation, Denise is arrested in May of 2018. She is charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and accessory after the fact. Her trial begins later that year in December 2018. The prosecution outlines how Denise allegedly began conspiring with Brian to murder Mike in March of 2000, nine months before his disappearance. Brian Winchester is the prosecution's star witness. Another scenario that we came up with was Mike and I going on a hunting trip together uh, and there being an accident where both he and I uh, ended up in the water and uh, he drowned and, and I did not. Denise liked this idea um, because it, I don't know how to word it exactly, but she felt better, I guess, about herself or we could feel better about ourselves if there was a, a chance that he could make it out of it, you know, I mean, I think there was even talk about, you know, well, it'll be up to God uh, what happens and not us. It won't be a murder. It'll be, you know, an accident. It would be fair to say that having the attention of being a widow was far better in her mind than being a divorcee. Yes, sir. Um, 
better to be a rich widow than a uh, a poor divorcee and her her biggest concern with the divorce was she didn't want to share custody of Ansley with with Mike um, she was not going to have Ansley going back and forth to two different uh, houses all of our conversations and planning and everything I, I, I would say is very mutual um, you know I, I'm not going to sit here and say that that uh, Denise planned everything and and you know I was just a dumb guy who went along with what she wanted to do I mean I I instigated a lot of it I, I helped come up with ideas I planned a lot of things um, but overall it was very mutual I mean we wanted to be together and we weren't gonna let anything stop that he also shares in the presence of jurors the events he previously outlined for investigators regarding Mike's disappearance including his and Denise's involvement he explains how he went out on the boat with his best friend, convinced him to put his waders on, pushed him over, and expected him to sink and drown. But it didn't go as planned. So, he was in the water, and he was, like, struggling. And the motor of the boat was still running. And I pulled off just a little bit to get kind of away from him so that he couldn't reach back into the boat. And I didn't know it at the time. I, I didn't know if he was trying to swim or I didn't know what was going on, but, but what I came to find out or eventually realized was he was taking the waders and the jacket off. And he, uh, he got those off and I, I think I forgot to tell you about this part before, but um, but I remember now that that area of the lake had a lot of um, snags, a lot of dead trees that come up out of the water, and there's a lot of stumps that come up out of the water. <laughs> and he swam over to one of those stumps and held on to it. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do. But um, he was. He started to yell. I had my gun in the boat. <laughs> and uh, so I loaded my gun. And he was in the water. And as I passed by, I shot him. Head. And, for good measure, the prosecution also drops a bombshell. They show Brian some photos. Do you recognize those photographs? Yes, sir. What are those photographs of? Um, they're photographs of Denise with my first wife, Kathy, of a sexual nature. And where were those photographs taken? Panama City. And when was that? I believe this was after Mike's death occurred. He also explained that the attempted kidnapping of Denise occurred because he was afraid that with the pending divorce, Denise might decide to divulge the truth about Mike's disappearance and turn him in. So in the car, he made her swear to never tell anyone and to take their secret to the grave. She promised that she would never tell. The prosecution lineup also included Cheryl Williams. When the article came out in the newspaper, Denise called me on the phone. She was livid. She said, you and Nick need to come over here right now. We went to her house in the front yard. We weren't even invited inside. She was screaming at me. She was mad about the article. And she said, screaming at me, I don't ever want to hear Mike's name again. I don't ever want to see Mike's picture in the paper again. I don't ever want to know anything you're doing about Mike again. I have to get on with my life. 
The jury deliberated for eight hours. They found Denise Williams Winchester guilty on all charges. Before her sentencing, there was one woman who had worked tirelessly for 17 years and had something to say. Judge Hankinson, for the next 17 years, I made telephone calls, put up missing person signs, compiled my notes into a book, and had people post on social media for me. With the help of friends, we raised money and put up billboards. I bought ads in the Tallahassee Democrat and worked with the Twin City News, asking everyone to help me find Mike. I stood on street corners waving my picket signs with pictures of Mike on them. I was cussed out by ministers for being too close to their church. I wrote 2,600 letters to the governor of Florida asking for help in finding my son. They told me Mike drowned and got eaten by alligators and there was no need for an investigation. They laughed at me and called me crazy. Nine months after Mike disappeared, his wife, Denise, told me if I continued to seek a criminal investigation, I would lose Ansley, my granddaughter, Mike's only child. Judge Hankinson, I am a fighter, not a victim. I love Ansley, but Mike was my son. Instead of investigating, they chose to ridicule and call me crazy and tell me that I didn't do things the right way. There is no manual to tell a mother what to do when her child goes missing. I just did what God put on my heart to do. Judge Hankinson, not only did Denise kill my son, she stole my granddaughter, Ansley, Mike's only child. For her entire life, Ansley was raised in a house with the murderers of her father while being denied the love of her father's family. I am asking you to lock Denise Merrill Williams Winchester up for the rest of her life with no chance of parole. She has already lived 18 years longer than my son. She got to watch Mike's daughter grow up. Nick, Mike, and I didn't. Judge Hankinson, for the rest of my life, when I try to sleep at night, I will see my son clinging to a tree stump and leg Seminole in the dark, knowing that his best friend is trying to kill him. I hear his voice screaming for help. I wasn't there to help him. It will haunt me forever. We are in this courtroom today because of God, not Cheryl Williams. I am Mike's mother, and I did what God told me to do. My son's horrific death demands justice. With today's sentencing of Denise Merrill, Williams, Winchester. I believe justice will have been served. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Denise Williams Winchester was sentenced to life in prison for the first-degree murder charge and 30 years for conspiracy to commit murder. Denise Winchester appealed her conviction and sentence, and in November of 2020, her first-degree murder conviction was overturned. The court ruled that the state failed to prove that she helped Brian Winchester commit the crime. Her conviction on conspiracy to commit murder was upheld. Denise is currently serving out her 30-year sentence for that crime at the Florida Women's Reception Center in Ocala, Florida. The state of Florida is appealing the overturned first-degree murder conviction in an attempt to have it reinstated. Brian Winchester is serving his sentence at Wakula Correctional Institution near Tallahassee, Florida. He will be eligible for parole in 2034, at which time he will be 63 years old. As far as we have learned, Cheryl has still not seen her granddaughter. 
She is said to take out an ad each year on Ansley's birthday in hopes that she'll see it and contact her. Until then, it has been reported that Ansley doesn't believe that her mother was involved in her father's murder. And now, this woman, we watched you, and we cried for you. You have our most sincere condolences, and our utmost admiration. When we struggle to fight our own seemingly insurmountable battles, we will think of you, and your one-woman protest, Cheryl Williams. What are your thoughts about this case and the extreme level of betrayal? Were you as affected as we were? Please share any thoughts in the comments below. And if you like how we presented this case, we'd really appreciate you hitting like and definitely hit subscribe so you never miss a single video.